Very good. So we're recording. Um, I wanted to uh, uh, continue, if we could, a discussion that we were uh, supposed to have right before Pesach. Um, so we've had a break, unfortunately, uh, not because of Pesach. Pesach was fine, but uh, unfortunately, Erev Pesach, when we were going to have a session, uh, we had a, uh, I had a funeral instead in our community. So we weren't able to meet. Um, and that made a, a, a little bit of an extra long break. This conversation was supposed to follow up right before Pesach, two weeks ago. Um, and that was after we uh, considered, I uh, shared with you a, a story that I found pretty amazing. Um, and uh, not just a piece of literature, uh, not that there's anything wrong with that. Um, we'll get back to those kinds of stories right away but um, a, a real life story that was uh, uh, put out uh, in a uh, tablet uh, about the Ablona Rebbe. So if you, were in, uh, uh, if you heard that story, the story was uh, a really uh, rich story about one person's uh, amazing uh, uh, odyssey, uh, exploration of new things, trying to be both a Rebbe, an old-fashioned Hasidic spiritual leader for his community of followers, and then uh, the tragedies and the crises that he uh, confronted um, and his being stuck in America for 40 years and losing his faith and then regaining his faith and rejoining his community uh, in uh, uh, the land of Israel and becoming their spiritual leader again. So um, that was what the story told. And I asked people to consider uh, what role or what kind of relationship we might uh, think about in that story, uh, the relationship between community and faith. Uh, when, we, when, when we think about faith, we think about it as a very personal thing. Um, my faith is my faith, yours is yours. I believe in certain things and I don't believe in other things. Um, and uh, each of us has the right to develop our, our, our own faith commitments and our own senses of what we have faith in and what we don't, and who we have faith in and who we don't. So uh, um, on the one hand, faith we think of as a very, very personal, private matter. At the same time, that story uh, was, as, as I was reading it and I was uh, uh, thinking about it, was a story about a man whose faith very much depended on his connection to his community. And, and uh, when he had his connection, he was a very, very uh, strong model of faith. And when he lost his connection, he lost his faith. So I was wondering if anybody wanted to share uh, some thoughts about that. Um, and I want to open it up to anybody who wants to do that. So uh, uh, if you want to say something, you know, raise your hand, unmute yourself, and, uh, you know, the floor is yours. The screen is yours. Okay, so we're going to have a silent session today. Um, okay, I, I, uh, I, I didn't want to bring up this question in order for me to give a lecture or a sermon. Um, I, I was uh, just oh, give, opening it up as, as, as something that people might find uh, uh, that they wanted to uh, relate to or struggle with. Um, so uh, somebody's presenting, apparently. So I think. Hello? I think somebody's one. Like thing. Yes, who's that? This is Merle. This is Merle. Yeah. Yes. Hello. Okay. Can you, Merle, one second, sure. though. Somebody's presenting, one of the Rita Singers yeah. is presenting. So you should please yes. can you, not present. Can you, you don't, don't present. Not just, present? Just, no, you don't have to, to be on. What do I do? You just, you, you take off presenting. You're on a phone, so I don't know how you unpresent. What if you're on, are you on a phone or on your computer? I'm on my computer. All right, so maybe if uh, we get some administrative tech uh, there's, there's a, on the bottom of your screen, right, they should be to help, open. Um, Helen get in. So I can't. Yeah. Unpresent. Unpresent. Okay, back to Merle. Okay, so, uh, so yes. exactly the same, but, um, 
My my father and his three brothers were raised in a, a Jewish orphanage in the in the twenties and uh, and up to the mid thirties or so, and um, they had prayers three times a day, and uh, it was it was a Jewish place. So um, one of my uncles, after he left and he went into the army, he wound up marrying a woman who wasn't Jewish, and he went up to the farm country. Um, in Massachusetts, and he became a dairy farmer, and uh, they had three kids. Um, their the kids until their mother died didn't know their father was Jewish. She didn't want us to tell or my parents to tell. So he was completely divorced from the Jewish community, and she died when he was about seventy. And he wound up remarrying a Jewish woman, and they lived in Florida in some little town where there were Jews, but not enough to support any kind of a, a synagogue or certainly not to hire a rabbi. But they would meet um, regularly. And guess who the leader of the services was? My, my <laughs> uncle. There you go. So, you know, I guess when it's ingrained or, or you know, you kind of were connected at one time, you can always go back in a certain way. Okay, so, so that... Oh God, that Another good story for our for our culture soul stories. Very interesting. Very very interesting. Um, and again, you know, the presence of that of that mini community made it possible for him to uh, come out of the closet, so to speak, mm -hmm. and and uh, rediscover a part of himself. Mm -hmm. exactly. um, right. Okay. Good. Thank you. Anybody else? If you're not going to be speaking right now, then I ask that you mute yourselves. If you're on a phone, it's star six. Um, and uh, that way, if there are background noises, we won't be distracted. Um, and if you're on a computer, then at the bottom of your screen, when you take your cursor, you, you can hit the, the, the mute thing, the microphone, and that's great. So uh, almost everybody has decided to mute themselves. Everybody did it. This is amazing. This is a story in and of itself. Yasha Koach to everybody. So, um, in I, I'm guess I'm guessing that there aren't any other uh, um, uh, comments or or additions that people want to add to that. I'm not. Oh, good. Okay, go ahead, Meredith. Hi. So I'll just add something. Um, you know, my family and I moved uh, to the area from Brooklyn almost five years ago, and we didn't know anybody here at all. Um, and we decide we had never been members of a synagogue before my entire adult life. I had never joined a synagogue, but we knew that by joining one, when we came here, we would have instant community. Um, and, and we definitely did. Even before we moved in, we went to some of the children's services. We met the Breslins who have become some of our dearest and closest friends. Um, we enrolled uh, my youngest, Nathaniel, in the Threes program at Shomre, and his he's still friends with uh, his best friend from then, and I'm still friends with the mom who lives near me. So in this way, uh, the Jewish faith led me to have sort of an instant built-in community around here, so, and a community I still have, and I'm very grateful for. And we're very grateful, too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, Leia, all the way from, you're right here in the neighborhood, right here on, in, in the same screen, but you have to unmute yourself. The bottom of your screen, you, you, you touch the uh, microphone picture. No, I can't hear a word. You didn't unmute yourself. No, cannot hear you. The bottom of your screen, take the cursor from your computer, the mouse, whatever it is, your finger. Go to the bottom of your screen, and there's a should be a white shelf that comes up with a picture of a microphone and a picture of a camera, and you. Sometimes you have to click on the screen. Okay. Did she leave? She must have left. She left. All right. Let's see what happens. All right. No, she didn't leave. Let's see. Can I do it? No, I can't do it. You can't unmute somebody. Right. All right. Good. So. Um, Okay. Sorry, I was uh, helping Helen trying to get in. Um, oh, I did it. You did it. Okay, good. So now, what's on your mind? I, I didn't hear the beginning of what it was actually we were supposed to share. I have a story, but I don't want to tell it if it's not what you're looking for. 
Okay, the, what we were, uh, what I was suggesting is that we would follow up on a story that I, that I, um, that I told um, a few weeks ago, and the continuation was to get some responses to that story. So uh, that that's that was the idea. So I wasn't uh, there two weeks ago. Right. You have a nice, interesting story that's short? Yeah, I guess. Yeah, I can tell it in a nutshell. Okay. Uh, it's, okay. My dad had uh, six, five siblings uh, born in Poland. Um, by and by, during all the wars, one of the brothers ended up in Brazil. And um, he wasn't going to stay there. He was, you know, everybody was wandering around at that time, not knowing where to go, fleeing from the Nazis. And um, somehow he met this Olga. She was not Jewish. And they fell in love. And he and she, they wanted, she wanted to convert, but the Jewish uh, community wouldn't allow it. And so they married anyway. And they had like five or six children, the children have children. There's like, there's like a hundred Hapners living there in Coritiba and they're, they're all not Jewish. I call them my non-Jew, my Gentile mafia. But the neat thing about it is every time we meet, they know the Lidl's, the dances, the prayers, the holidays, because my father's brother's son, my father's brother taught his son and the son taught his son and so on. So they know about the Jewish religion and we're in really good uh, terms. Okay. That's so, a, a, another one of these very, very fascinating, truer, you know, truer than fiction stories. Um, and uh, these are uh, stories that uh, are very uh, poignant during this time. Um, Monday night, we had our community observance of Yom HaShoah, of Holocaust Remembrance Day. It falls out on the 27th day of the Hebrew month of Nisan every year. So in the English calendar, it's all over the place. But in the Hebrew calendar, it falls out approximately a week after Passover is over. And uh, we had our community observance this, this year uh, involving the showing of a film that had a lot of really uh, I found very moving stories, uh, stories of love in the middle of hate and destruction and cruelty and death, uh, stories of, of, of pain and, uh, and yet uh, stories of, of real living. Um, I was thinking that for today, yeah, so this is an ongoing uh, uh, issue and uh, the way that we're going to respond to that is actually going to be in every day and in every week uh, of our lives as we connect and disconnect and and come closer and draw further away and discover different layers of what this can mean. Um, even the word faith in in our conversation was used in I think uh, slightly different ways. Um, we can talk about the Jewish faith. Um, without actually defining, well, what is that? What is the Jewish faith? Um, you know, how many books have been written about this? Um, then when you read the book and you go, well, I don't believe in that, and I don't believe in that, and I don't believe in that part of the book, and I don't believe in that part of what it says. So in what sense um, is the faith, the Jewish faith, um, something that uh, is part of, of each of us? And uh, in some sense, um, the Jewish faith may you know one part of it may be really really strong in you and one part of it may be really really strong in you like i need i can do it like this right and one part may be really really strong in you and then one part may be very weak in me um and what happens is is that the community actually sustains the the, the overall organic unity of the faith uh while each and every one of us holds up a particular kind of piece of it um, and uh, that's the way, of course, any life in a community works, is that there are people that have certain talents and certain skills and certain time uh, uh, that they can, uh, uh, resources that they can give. And then other people have other kinds of uh, uh, time, resources, skills, et cetera, or interests. And then it combines. 
so uh, that's that's the way it works also for this kind of uh, uh, catechism of uh, of Jewish faith um, to use a, a, a goyish term right something that we don't quite uh, uh, insist on precisely for this reason precisely for this so thank you I wanted to share a different kind of story today um, and it comes from a repository of stories by a Hasidic Rebbe. So there's a little bit of a connection um, in this thread that, that we're going through. Um, by the way, I already decided next week. Next week, I would like to share a story by Grace Paley, um, a wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, author uh, who died only a few years ago. And I actually shared one story, a very short story of hers, last Rosh Hashanah, when I read it from the from the uh, Bima. And uh, so we're going to do a contemporary literary work next next week, I hope. Uh, but today I wanted to come back to a, to a, 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 a source of stories. That, as I say, it comes from a Hasidic leader, a Hasidic rabbi, a Hasidic master, someone who had his own group his own community that followed him uh, and uh, was devoted to his leadership. And this uh, leader was Nachman of Bratslav. So many, many of you may have heard of him. Uh, he lived uh, in the, eight, the end of the 18th century, beginning of the 19th century. He was born 1772. He died 1810. So he died over 200 years ago. He lived at the very cusp of the uh, onslaught of modernity as it was washing over the Jewish people. And also the time of, uh, the, toward the end of his life, the time of the Napoleonic Wars and Napoleon sweeping through Europe and liberating the Jews wherever he went, uh, whatever you know, bad things Napoleon was guilt guilty of, he was the force that the, uh, for the emancipation of the Jewish people. Before he came along, there wasn't a single country in the entire world where a Jew was a full citizen, anywhere. Um, and then he started liberating, emancipating, like we use the word emancipation proclamation for the slaves in the United States. Um, he emancipated the Jews as he was going through Europe and conquering Europe and, and uh, creating his empire. So uh, um, that was at the you know the the beginning of the 19th century. So Nachman of Bratislav lived during that time. If you if you did a quick math of his of his dates, he died when he was 38 years old. Uh, so he died incredibly young, and yet he was an amazingly uh, 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 influential and uh, uh, productive uh, uh, master and teacher, and. Uh, he was uh, unique in many ways. I'm not going to go through his whole philosophy. But one of the things that he did that uh, had never been done before by a rabbinic figure of, of you know, weight as a, as, a, as a holy man and as a, uh, uh, you know, a learned person was he made up stories. Not just that people always would tell stories embellished stories from the Midrash about uh, Abraham or about uh, uh, Moses or about Sarah, whatever. Um, there were stories in our literature about biblical figures. There were stories about holy people. So that, uh, um, that's right, he did. He wrote the word, the whole world is just a narrow bridge. The main thing is not to be afraid. So that's the that's famous teaching of his. So um, he added a new genre, which we take for granted, but he added the genre of stories, not stories about biblical figures, not stories about great rabbis who were identifiable. Oh, let me tell you a story about the Baal Shem Tov. He, by the way, was the great grandson of the Baal Shem Tov, the rabbi who started the Hasidic movement. And uh, uh, but he created toward the end of his short life. He was very sick. He had tuberculosis. He suffered quite a bit. Um, he lost his whole family uh, uh, pretty much and to, to 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 different kinds of illness with his wife, his only son. Um, before he before he himself uh, died, he knew a lot of tzaras. 
Um, and uh, besides teaching that the main thing is not to be afraid, he also taught that mitzvah gedola liot besimcha tamid. It's a great mitzvah to always be suffused with joy. And uh, he fought that battle all the time. Um, so uh, my cousin once asked me, uh, if you're supposed to always be full of joy, what happens when you're depressed? Uh, and I said, you should be depressed with fully put all your joy into that depression. <laughs> be be, be as, as into it as, as you can be, because depression is very debilitating. Depression is, is, is saps all your strength. When he says joy, he doesn't mean just laughing and, and frivol frivolity. He means to put your vitality into things, to, to continue to try to uh, uh, thrive. Anyway, so besides all of his very profound uh, teachings that uh, involved a lot of Kabbalistic and, and esoteric uh, uh, learning, he decided toward the end of his life, he said to his followers, you know what? I've tried to teach you Torah in so many different ways. I've decided I'm doing a new thing. I'm going to tell you stories. And if you get some, some moral or some lesson from the story that connects up with your Torah, with your Torah learning, wonderful. But you know what? At least, if, even if you don't do that, at least you'll hear a good story. And that's something too. So he created a book. Uh, of uh, a collection of stories, and I thought I had it here on my desk, and uh, I don't have it here. It's called Sipure Maasiot, and there are uh, 13 official stories that were collected in that book, and then he, um, later on, some other smaller stories were, were uh, uh, reported in his name. So I'm going to share with you one of those stories. It's a shorter story. Some of them are very long and very involved, and some of them are shorter. So today, I thought we would have time for at least one short story, and we'll see and we'll see how it goes. So the um, the version that I'm reading to you is an English translation um, put out uh, by uh, Arnold Band, and this is the uh, edition that I'm reading from. It's called. The story, it's called Nachman of Ratzlav, The Tales. It's in a wonderful series called Classics of Western Spirituality. And uh, it has a translation of the stories. And then it has a little bit of commentary. In the Bratzlav Hasidic community, these stories are treated like the Torah. So there are commentaries and commentaries and more commentaries and more commentaries on, on these stories. Um, one other interesting thing about it is that these stories were originally told in Yiddish. And they uh, then when Rav Nachman said, I want these published, he told his scribe, uh, uh, Rav Nasson, Nathan Sternhardt, that um, he wanted the book to be published with the Yiddish on the bottom of the page and a Hebrew translation on the top of the page. And that's the way it's now published uh, in the official editions. So, uh, and now we're doing a translation uh, that is based, banned, uh, did his translation by consulting both the Yiddish and the Hebrew. So the name of this story is The King Who Decreed Conversion. Once there was a king who decreed for his country exile or conversion. Whoever wanted to stay in the country would have to convert. And if not, he would be exiled from the country. There were some who renounced all their property and riches and left in poverty so as to remain with their faith as Jews. Some of them felt sorry for their riches and remained and became Moranos. Secretly, they practiced the Jewish religion, but in public, they were not allowed to do so. Then the king died, and his son became king. And he began to govern the country sternly. He conquered several countries and was very, quote, unquote, wise. And since he controlled the ministers of the kingdom harshly, 
They took counsel and conspired to destroy him and his seed. Among the ministers, there was one of the Moranos who thought to himself, why am I a Morano? Since I felt sorry for my money and my property, now that the country will be without a king, the people will eat each other alive. It's impossible to have a country without a king. That is why he decided to go himself to the king without their knowing it and tell him. And he went and told the king that they were conspiring against him. The king tried to test whether this was true and he saw that it was true and stationed guards. And on the night that they attacked him, the guards caught them and the king judged them each according to his case. The king spoke out and said to the Morano minister, what honor shall I give you for saving me and my seed? If I want to make you a minister, you are already a minister. You tell the king, talk the good Yiddish. And if I want to give you money, you have it. Say what honor you want and I shall do it for you. The Morano answered and said, will you do what I tell you? The king said, yes. Said he, swear to me by your crown and your kingdom. And he swore. The Morano spoke out and said, the honor which is most important to me is that I should be allowed to be a Jew in public, to put on palit and tefillin in public. The king was very angry, since in all his country, people were not allowed to live as Jews. But he had no choice because of his oath. In the morning, the Morano went and put on talit and tefillin in public. Afterwards, the king died and his son became king. And he began to govern the country gently, since he had seen that the people had wanted to destroy his father. He conquered many countries and was very, very wise. And he ordered all the astrologers to assemble, to predict, to predict by what his seed would be destroyed so that he could take heed. They told him that his seed would be destroyed unless he took heed of the ox and the lamb. And they wrote this in the book of records. And he ordered his sons that they too should govern the country gently the way he had done. And he died. His son became king. And he began to govern the country sternly and forcibly, like his grandfather. He conquered many countries. And he hit upon the idea of declaring that there should not be found in his country neither an ox nor a lamb so that his seed would not be destroyed. Thus, he had no fear of anything. He governed his country sternly and became very wise and fell upon the idea of conquering the entire world without war. That is, there are seven parts to the world because the world had been divided into seven parts. And there are seven planets and each planet shines upon one part of the world. And there are seven kinds of metals, for each of the seven planets shines with one kind of metal. He went and gathered all the seven kinds of metal and ordered his men to fetch all the golden portraits of all the kings which hung in their palaces. From this he made a man, his head of gold, his body of silver, and the rest of the limbs of the other kinds of metal. There were in that man all seven kinds of metal, and he placed him on a high mountain. All the seven planets shone on that man. When a man needed some advice, whether to make a certain deal or not, he would stand opposite the limb made from the kind of metal that corresponded to the part of the world where he came from and would think whether or not to do it. If he was supposed to do it, that limb would light up and shine. And if not, the limb would darken. 
The king did all this, and thus he conquered the entire world and collected much money. This image of the man was capable of all this only on condition that the king would humble the proud and exalt the humble. So he sent orders to all the generals and noblemen who had appointments and ranks. They all came and he humbled them and stripped them of their appointment. He stripped even those who had been appointed and worked for his great great grandfather. And he exalted the humble and put them in their place. The Murano minister was among the noblemen whom the king acted to humble. And the king asked him, what are your privileges and appointment? And he replied, my privilege is to be allowed to be a Jew in public because of the favor I did to your grandfather. The king stripped him of it and he became a Murano again. One night, the king went to sleep and saw in a dream that the sky was clear. And he saw all 12 constellations of the zodiac. The stars in the heavens are divided into 12 sectors, corresponding to the 12th month. One sector looks like a lamb, Aries. And this is the constellation of the month of Nisan, the month that we are about to conclude. That's my parenthesis. The constellation of the month of Er, which we're about to start on Friday, is called an ox, Taurus. The king saw that among the constellations of the zodiac, the ox, Taurus, and the lamb, Aries, were laughing at him. He woke up in great anger and was terrified. He ordered his servant to fetch the book of records and saw written there that his seed would be destroyed by an ox and a lamb. Great fear seized him and his soul was much disturbed. He summoned interpreters of dreams, but each interpreted to himself and their voices did not reach his ears. A very great fear seized him. Then a wise man came to him and told him that he had heard from his father that the sun had 365 courses and that there was a place where all the courses were shining and an iron staff grows there when whosoever was fearful came to this place he was saved from his fear the king felt better and he his wife and sons and all his seed went with the wise man to that place in the middle of the way stood an angel who was in charge of anger. As a result of anger, a destructive angel is formed. And this angel was in charge of all destructive forces. People would ask him for the way, for there was a way that went straight ahead and a way full of mud and a way full of holes and pits and so on. And there was also a way where there was a fire and one could burn at a distance of four miles from that fire. So they asked him for the way and he showed them the way where the fire was. They walked on and the wise man looked forward every now and then to see whether the fire was there because he had heard from his father that there was such a fire. In time, he saw the fire. And he saw that kings and Jews wrapped in talit and tefillin were walking through the fire. Since Jews were living in the countries of those kings, they were able to walk through the fire. The wise man said to the king, since I have a tradition, that one can burn up four miles away from the fire, I do not want to walk any further. The king thought that since he saw the other kings walking through the fire, he too would walk. The wise man replied, I have that tradition 
from my father so i do not want to go if you want to go go the king and his seed went and the fire overcame them and he and his seed burned and all were destroyed when the wise man came home the ministers wondered he took heed of ox and lamb why were he and his seed destroyed the Murano minister spoke out and said, he was destroyed through me. The astrologers saw, but did not know what they saw. From the skin of the ox, one makes tefillin. And from the wool of the lamb, one makes fringes for the talit. And through them, he and his seed were destroyed. Those kings in whose country Jews lived, dressed in talit and tefillin, they walked through the fire and were not harmed at all. He was destroyed because Jews who wear talit and tefillin were not permitted to live in his country. That is why the ox and the lamb in the planets were laughing at him. For the astrologers saw and did not know what they saw so he and his seed were destroyed that's the story so um let's uh, see if we can uh, uh react to it respond to it there's uh it's a it's a short story but it's got a lot of convoluted stuff to it um got so many elements of fairy tales to it it's got a lot of allusions to biblical figures um some people might have recognized uh, a motif here and there from from the torah from from the biblical stories um there's all kinds of levels for us to be able to uh, uh uh you know unpack the story if we if we try does anybody want to uh, respond first? If you're on the phone and you want to unmute, press star six. Thank you. Um, yeah, the beginning of the story, the the first part reminded me a lot of the story of Queen Esther, um, uh -huh. you know, hiding and speaking exactly. up to the king. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that whole thing about saving the king's life mm -hmm. and then writing it down in a book. And then That's getting right. a favor. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Exactly. Very, very, very much on to the point. So. I it would that it were so <laughs> i mean it seems like most of the kings that have you know gone against the jews suffered no ill effects. well I, as i said this is the week of yom hashoah um it's one of the one of the uh, uh things that was on my mind about about sharing this story um and i and i gave a little bit of a historical uh uh you know uh, uh context for the story um when i first introduced it he's talking about a king that is conquering the world right he he that that these kings each one of them generation after generation are empire builders they're trying to take over the world one way or another whether through harsh measures through war way no i maybe i won't do it through war maybe i'll do it by by uh, by giving uh, people uh, you know some kind of benefit that'll win them over um and as i say he's telling the story at the time of the Napole Napole napoleonic uh invasions and uh, uh the uh the prospect of uh of a world empire being created by this guy and one of his as i say one of his agenda uh items whatever other cruelties or massacres or uh, uh political intrigues he was involved in he was freeing the jews so uh that's that's you know definitely part of the of the poignancy of the story when he first uh told it um anybody uh want to chime in with some other stuff how about the how about the astrologers who, who try to interpret the dreams but they can't succeed it's like sort of uh joseph it's like, right right you know, straight, out, straight out of the joseph story um and that's part of what he's doing right he's taking motifs that people know already and he's also apparently when nobody was looking been reading Grimm's fairy tales and stuff like that 
um, and he's mixing it all together in some, you know, in some kind of like chulant uh, to, uh, uh, you know, to then create his 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 new thing. I don't think there's any Grimm's fairy tale that tells about a triumphant Jew uh, at the end. Um, now that would be counter to the whole to the whole ethos of 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 that literature. So, what's he doing when he does that? What's he doing when when he actually gives all of these tyrants their comeuppance, and and this person uh, goes, "It's all because of me." All well, because it, it, there is a connection to Grimm. I mean, in terms of like the you know the the way Grimm's fairy tales function was to sort of empower children being told these stories. Right? They could kill the witch. They could. You know, kill the the wolf could be killed or whatever. You know, the so in a way it works the same way. It's like um, an empowering feeling that it gives the person. Mm -hmm. Right, and takes away all the things that you're afraid of, so that you can handle it. You can, you don't have to st you don't have to be paralyzed by that fear. Right, you're strong enough to battle that fear and to overcome it. Yeah, Rabbi, okay. isn't there something in the it's either in the Bible or the sages that lands which are good to the Jews do well and those which persecute the Jews will fail or will flounder. Am I well, remembering I, from somewhere else? I, I think that uh, you can probably find that someplace. It's wishful thinking. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's been some historical... Uh, evidence of that, you know, when when uh, the Jews have been thrown out of many countries, the country's economy uh, struggles, the country's culture struggles. Um, there's a, a kind of a vitality that that uh, um, is lost. And uh, over in the Middle Ages, many many, you know, when Europe was basically, you know, just like this, you know, checkerboard of of uh, countries and and duchies and and principalities and so on. If the Jews were kicked out of one place, some mm -hmm. other duke or, or prince saw this as a great opportunity. Oh, great. This is going to give me the opportunity to actually now, you know, make my country or my little, uh, you know, feudal, uh, uh, you know, area um, successful. Yeah. I'll, I'll invite the Jews to come in where I am. Yeah. Um, but the truth of the matter was, as I said before, until Napoleon emancipated the Jews, we always were the uh, um, the Blanche Dubois of the world. Mm. We were always we were always dependent on the. On the kindness of strangers. Okay. It was a nice king. Then we had a good breather for a while. Mm -hmm. If the king changed his mind, or if, or if the next uh, you know king came in, just like the Bible story, you know, one pharaoh is great. Yeah, pharaoh. Next pharaoh do not just. Doesn't doesn't want to know about it, right? Mm -hmm. So so yes. That's that's definitely what the reality was, and um, you know, it's it's uh, it's nice to sometimes lose ourselves in a different historical period, um, but of course we're always standing where we are. We're always where we you know where we're located spatially and and temporally. So the, it does this besides it just being some quaint historical reflection right. of, of the Jews. Uh, um, um uh, yeah it's a good question um what the, the uh, i don't know if you saw in the in the yeah, chat yeah. i just asked what was in it for napoleon, napoleon. To, to the jews what what did he get out of that uh, well let's let's keep that for us for the, in, on the side for, uh, for a second but Rabbi, is there, is i the, have a question okay it's Anne. um i'm curious about the remark where he said um, early on the morano that he knows that if there's no king the people are going to all kill each other off therefore he has to back someone and and let him remain to be remain a king i know that uh, democracy had not yet come to uh, the, the the consciousness but uh, the jewish people had a uh, tradition of living without a king so there's some confusion for me there so so it goes back to what i was just saying a second ago i think that you you're talking about an, an interesting you're bringing up an interesting uh, idea, a, a political science uh, uh, issue. Um, you know, what's how do how do how do societies manage to not destroy themselves? And uh, you have many many you know. different kinds of philosophies of 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 uh, you know the strongman theory. Uh, democracy is is a, a, a Johnny come lately to the idea 
of actually how to run a society. Certainly, Napoleon was anti-democracy uh, in that in that kind of way. Um, but uh, uh, the Jews depended on a strong leader. That was part of the tragedy of Jewish living until the modern period, was that the Jews had to make some kind of modus vivendi. They had to figure out some way to get along with whoever had the power. Because if they didn't get along, they would get killed or they would get expelled. Um, and they needed to figure out how to negotiate with those people who had power. And if they had a positive relationship, then those people with power were their protectors. They were their protectors when there was a pogrom. They were their protectors when there was uh, the Black Plague and, and a mob would come through the Jewish quarter. If you lived in an area where the, the Duke you know, was interested in protecting you, you'd get protection. If you were in a, in a place where the, where the Duke, uh, to use uh, uh, Leia's uh, you know, question, if, it, if he said, it's not, it's not worth it for me to fight my people of, you know, to protect the Jews, then the Jews got it. So, but this is an ancient teaching. This actually comes from Pirkei Avot, which we're gonna be starting to study on Sunday mornings. The, the fundamental um, ethical teachings of our sages. And they say, Always pray for the well-being of the government. Uh, because if it were not for fear of the government, each person would swallow up the other person. It would be as, as you know, the, the war of all against all, Thomas Hobbes. The Hobbesian uh, nightmare of chaos that would that would ensue. Um, that's why, in, when we have our our you know regular uh, traditional Shabbat services, may we restore them to their glory soon in our time. Um, we always pray for our country and for the state of Israel. Where does that come from? Why did we decide all of a sudden to start? The answer is that we've been praying for the, the peace and welfare of every single country that we've ever lived in. Praying for the welfare of our country wasn't instituted when we came to the United States. I have a chumash, which is printed in the back of the chumash. It has the prayers, and it has there, may God watch over and bless the czar, just like in Fiddler on the Roof. I have another machzor uh, where uh, uh, I have a, a, the prayer printed up, May God watch over the Kaiser. Um, so uh, um, you know, praying for a, a quiet, stable society meant that we need somebody who's going to actually keep law and order or else it's going to be a mess. Um, and, you know, as you say, now we live in a, in a, in a time when democracy has become uh, uh, a known idea. And of course, what are we looking at over the last 10, 15 years? Democracy is, in, is, in, is on the defensive now. People are not believing that democracy gives a stable enough society for them. They're so full of fear of, of strangers and of others um, that they, they want that strong you know, tyrant, that dictator. It's uh, an art country which has no excuse whatsoever, has become paranoid. And, and has put as as their leader, you know, a, a, a uh, an abomination. And it's all because of this, you know, uh, desire for for safety and stability. So it's an ancient idea. It has part. It has some truth to it. Anarchy is is not good. But you know, the the gen the genius of democracy is to believe that if you actually crowdsource authority, you can have a much more constructive, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, environment, but it's very hard to do that. It's very hard to accomplish that. My father used to say all the time, the veneer of civilization is thin, very thin. Right. And I've been thinking of that a lot lately. Right. Yeah. Um, just a, a kind of a, a facetious um, you know, uh, answer to, to the question of what did Napoleon get out of it? Um, to a certain extent, what Napoleon got out of it was he 
liked undermining everybody else's society and and by you know undermining the governmental controls and the rules of that society uh, by by giving that the outsider the quintessential outsider for Europe was the Jew um, by by saying no this outsider is now an insider he was shaking up everything he was he was uh, um, and he got a lot of I think I think he got a lot of uh, a delight out of doing that it was part of his overall sense that and then the only person who's going to be able to keep all these pieces back together again is me who does that sound like yeah he wanted to make a europe great again what can i say yeah um what is what is how did that 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 uh, sentence that when when the the morano said the greatest gift you can give me is to allow me to be a Jew in public. How does that sound to to to, to you? Does anybody want to talk about about what that what that might mean? What does that mean today? Um, well, today I think that has a lot to do with. I, I mean, what I got from it was uh, members of the LGBTQ plus community. Um, I got from it that it means being able to live your truth, to live freely without fear of persecution, of bullying, uh, you know, to be able to live your life without in, in the way that feels right to you without fear. Okay, very, very uh, powerful uh, uh, and challenging value, right? There's a lot of people who are afraid of the concept of people living without fear. Right, coming back to that uh, anarchy thing, that 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 you know, identity politics is 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 said with a sneer, as if what's you know what's with all those people who want to be free and who want to be unashamed and who won't, don't want to be subjected to to contempt by and by and, and who challenge my own way of thinking, my own beliefs. You know, if if they are living a certain way and they think that they're right, then do they think that I'm wrong? Am I wrong? Mm -hmm. Right. So this is this is a, the, one of the big questions. Um, is it all or nothing? Right. Yeah. Um, we we, we uh, in in I say we. I'm, uh, you know most of the people in Montclair who subscribe to a kind of a liberal uh, um, uh, set of values are at least theoretically willing to accept the idea that you can have multiple uh, ways of life. Uh, uh, next to each other that don't threaten each other. That it's not everybody has to be my way or everybody has to be your way. Um, at least theoretically, that's the way uh, it's, it's uh, I think, affirmed. Um, although when we get to the nitty gritty, it, it, it doesn't always work out so so smoothly. Yeah, everybody's got their sacred cows and everybody's got their, you know, right. people they don't consider people um, right. on all sides. Right. So. Right. That's I mean, part of the problem in this country is that people stop talking to each other and they start talking to the other's ideologies, the supposed ideologies, rather than talking to each other. That's kind of the whole point. That's the whole problem. That's why democracy is in peril. That's why democracy is in peril. Right. Because, right. because I mean, you know, one good thing our founders understood is that we could have a demagogue. You know, you could have a very popular leader who's wrong. So we, they tried to build in all kinds of minority protections uh, and checks and balances. And the, the, a lot of that is done by tradition more than the actual letter of the law. So it just takes somebody like Trump to undo those traditions and start issuing decrees. So, but it's, the, what, what scares me about the future mostly is that nobody, the people just don't talk to each other anymore. They don't, they don't have any accommodation for the other. And that, I, I see that on all sides, actually. Yeah. Um, Leah. Yes. Yeah, so I think you asked, how does that translate today? We luckily here in Brookline too, we have freedom of worship and prayer, whatever we want to do in any synagogue. We have a lot of synagogues, but the fact that we have to have police outside now every Shabbat and every major happening is, I don't know. It's very, it's, we don't know what's going to happen. Right. Before we got hit with the pandemic, we were uh, in all kinds of uh, states of stress and anxiety about uh, the rise of anti-Semitism and about 
the specifically targeted attacks against people who wear talit and tefillin. Right, that was that was the predominant anti-Jewish, uh, um, you know, set of events that happened. People who were identifiably Jewish, who were Jewish in public, uh, in ways that we are not. Yeah, we, we like when this story says live publicly as a Jew. We we generally don't. I mean, we don't. We go to our synagogue, but we don't wear a kippot, and we don't we don't identify. I mean, it's made me think about maybe I should be wearing a kippah everywhere. Maybe we should. Well, when, you're a big, I, you're a big guy, so people are going to be afraid to to, to tussle with you. Yeah. Uh, when I live, people do walk around with kippot. Okay, yeah, I do know somebody who has started wearing uh, her kippa in public more because of the recent spate of anti-Semitism. And I mean, except for the pandemic when I'm quarantined, anyway, I've been wearing my Star of David a lot more when I go out. Yeah. Right. This this was, I mean, I, I wear a, a pretty big kippah, um, and uh, you know, thankfully, I, I haven't had uh, anything but positive experiences, um, you know, uh, as a result when people saw it and identified what it was. Um, in Europe, I was very conscious of this. In oh. Europe, or 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 not just Europe, in traveling in general, because it's some sometimes we remember in Mexico, when in uh, in this, you know off the beaten track place, all of a sudden, oh, shalom, shalom, shalom. All of a sudden, mm -hmm. yeah, this is a Hispanic person is like uh, running after me and and, uh, <laughs> and embracing me. Um, so uh, <laughs> there was, uh, uh, you know, there, there have been, and then there are all these, again, secret Jews who have come over to me and smiled or, or thanked me or said hello. And uh, there is, you know, a, a whole, a whole hodgepodge of of uh, feelings and reactions, and uh, 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 resistance, and also, uh, uh, you know, running away from this idea. Do I need the trouble? Do I need it? Do I do I want to be proud? I can be proud in my heart. Okay, to be continued. Um, and I look forward, if you want to join for another story, next week we're going to have a, a different kind of story, as I said, uh, from Grace Paley. So um, um, are people joining for some other session that's supposed to start at 3 o'clock? Like What's at 3 o'clock? Nothing. The yeah. conclusion of, they're coming in to join for the conclusion of this session. Uh -huh. So thank you to everybody. Thank Be you, well. Rabbi. Be thank well. you, Rabbi. Oh, by the way, this evening is the town hall. Yeah. Who will be involved in the in the conversation at eight o'clock about how we can uh, see uh, about going forward. What other kinds of ideas? If people have things to contribute, uh, suggestions, that would be great. Okay. The uh, link to the meeting is on stormray.org on the homepage. Thank, Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Rabbi. 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 Thank you, Rabbi.